we're continuing, uh, we're, we're going to finish the book, uh, this, the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians the next week, the next two weeks, and uh, today and next week, and I, uh, then we're going to take a little hiatus, but I just wanted to uh, remark that this fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, this part of the great detour we've been talking about, the big great digression that Paul takes here, where he dives into doctrine, um, this is a chapter that, that is all about our hope and our expectation and about what's ahead for us as believers. And in a world of uncertainty, a world of danger, a world of um, conflict, with a lot of hatred and a lot of finger pointing around and a lot of uh, people making judgments about other people and their motives, I think it's good for us to keep our eyes on the prize, keep our eyes on, on our hope and on what's ahead. Not that we retreat from this world, but that we um, have our, our grounding really certain in the hope that is laid out for us in Scripture. <clears throat> Would you uh, follow along as I read... 2 Corinthians 5, the first 10 verses. Now we know that, the, that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. As Paul launches into this chapter, he's, he's really just continuing what he was talking about just prior to this in chapter 4. We fix our eyes on, not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary the things that are unseen are eternal and so the very next thing he talks about is our our heavenly uh habitation and by habitation i don't mean a mansion in heaven i don't mean a, a, an apartment we live in he's it's clear he's talking here about our heavenly bodies a, a heavenly dwelling of our spirit in heaven where we uh, will be with christ um, some people view heaven as uh, this ghostly place where, you know, the angels float around on clouds and, and we can all see through each other. <laughs> Scripture has nothing to say about that. Scripture does not even hint at that kind of existence. It, it tells us clearly that when we are in eternity with God, after the final judgment after the, after the day of the, what Paul calls the day of redemption, after that day, we will have eternal, permanent bodies. So that's the, that's the context here. There's a, the, the flavor of this whole thing is, should remind us of Easter, really. We're, we're, we're back on, on Easter Sunday, 
with the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead because he is the first fruits of those who slept. He is the, he's the very first one who has gone before us and led the way to show us what's ahead for those who put their trust in him. And as he came forth from that grave in power, as he inhabited a body that was, was able to do things we can't even conceive of, that is what's ahead for us. We don't know that our bodies will have all the capabilities that Jesus did when he came back from the grave, but a lot of people have speculated that that's really what, what we have ahead of us um, in these heavenly bodies. The context here is, is actually chapter 4, verse 14, that we covered uh, last week. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. Jesus is the first one to be raised, but we're next on that day, that day of redemption. So what does Paul say in verse 1 about our future dwelling? He talked uh, at the beginning of the last chapter, remember we talked about jars of clay, clay pots. Uh, the, the whole point of a jar of clay is that it's fragile. It's not ever meant to be permanent. Uh, clay pots were produced by the thousands. That, that, was the, that was the closest thing they had to mass production in the first century was clay. It was clay pots, pottery. And, very, and they, could, they could vary in quality, but no clay pot was ever expected to live forever. So a clay pot is fragile, it's temporary, and so is a tent. He, he calls our bodies tents, this earthly tent we live in. Paul was a tent maker, wasn't he? It's interesting that he picked this analogy. Any of you ever go camping? Would any of you ever want to live in a tent year-round? Any of you ever done a winter camping experience? I did when I was at Oak Hills, Bemidji, Minnesota, 20 below every night. And at the end, our, our, uh, our final that we looked forward to was, okay, we're going to spend a night outside in winter without tents. And the goal, the idea was that our, insul that our nice insulated sleeping bags would be so toasty <laughs> that we, our bodies would warm up the insides of those sleeping bags and we'll, we'd have them buried in the snow and, and it would just be really nice. <laughs> I lasted about five minutes. <laughs> Maybe five, I don't know, it, it was maybe a half hour. Number one, I didn't have the right kind of sleeping bag. But anyway, um, a tent is not meant to be a permanent living arrangement. And tents wear out, and tents are fragile, and tents uh, don't do a very good job of completely keeping out the elements. So a tent is an imperfect... Uh, uh, arrangement, invention of men that, that, uh, that Paul contrasts here with two other words. The word house, not a tent, but a house in heaven, and a dwelling. So those two words are, are contrasted with tent. Our heavenly dwelling made by God himself, not made with human hands. Can you imagine living for eternity in a body that was designed by God and that he worked on perfecting that design? Some people believe that when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, he was talking about not just an apartment, or a, a mansion in heaven. He was talking about our physical bodies. Our human bodies will be amazing. Permanent, durable, eternal. 
And I'm looking forward to that day. And they won't have anything to do with medicine or they won't need any medicine. They won't need science. They won't need, they won't need tending to. Um, I don't know even, as I think about this, I'm not even sure that when we're in heaven in our glorified state, that we will care where we live. You know, there's all these jokes out there and all these little stories about uh, people dying to go to heaven and one gets a really nice mansion and one gets a really humble little cottage, you know, in the back street somewhere. And Like, well, what happened there, you know? Um, I, I'm not so sure it's going to matter. Because we will be in a state where wherever we are, it will be where God has prepared for us. And our bodies will be able to handle anything, anything, anywhere we go. That's our future dwelling. But what about between now and then? Especially between when we die and when we reach that eternal state. Is, is there an intermediate state? Well, obviously there is. There, there's, there's a time between when we die and when we stand before God and receive what God has prepared for us on that day when we are in his presence and it's the day of redemption. Now, the, ch the early church struggled with this a little bit because for a long time, for, for years during the early church, there was, the, there was a strong conviction that Christ was going to come back and that most people were not, never going to have to die who were in Christ, who had believed in Christ. They would simply, Christ would come and they would go to be with him. Um, as time wore on and people started to pass away, then you, then you had Paul having to direct teaching at that, and that is part of what he did with the Thessalonians. He said, you know, some of you have been told uh, people who die, uh, who are in Christ, you know, that essentially something went wrong there. That uh, they died too soon. Christ, they had to wait for Christ to come, and now that he hasn't come yet, then, then we've got a problem. Paul said, no, no, that's all part of the plan. But this new uh, reality, this, this uh, future that is there for believers, he says in verses 2 to 4, Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And I think of, I think of uh, Romans 8. Actually, Steve read this for us this morning during Sunday school, and, and I, I thought of this uh, passage in Romans 8, starting with verse 22. We know that the, old, the whole creation has been groaning in, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. So this hope that we have is the redemption of our bodies. And it's, there's a groaning that goes into that. There's a sense of, I know that this isn't all there is. I know, uh, I know there's something better ahead. When I watched my mother pass away almost 15 years ago, there was a conviction that she was experiencing something I could not comprehend. Now, at that point, I believe it was only what, what she was experiencing was the presence of Christ in a way she'd never experienced it before. Because she had not achieved her, her heavenly body. She had not been given her heavenly body. But 
but the groaning, the groaning for eternity, the groaning to go past, the, the sense that this world is not my home. You ever remember that old, that old Negro spiritual? This world is not my home, I'm just, just to pass them through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And that's, that's what we groan for. We groan for that which, that we can't see it, we can't touch it, but we know it's there. We long for it. He uses the word naked. He says, okay, we want, our, we want to be clothed with our heavenly bodies. We don't want to be found naked. And there's that sense of nobody wants to be uh, without a body, right? And uh, he knows that the body he has here on this earth is, is temporary, it's imperfect, but at least it's a body. And, and he knows that he has a body waiting for him on that day when Jesus Christ says, well done, good and faithful servant. He knows that that is waiting for him on the day of redemption, on the day of resurrection. But in between, what, what, is, what does the intermediate state really consist of? There are those who misunderstand Scripture who believe that when we die prior to Jesus' return, that there's a, there's a state of unconsciousness, there's a state of, of what is called soul sleep, that we, we go into a, a state of, in a sense, suspended consciousness. Our consciousness is not awake until the day Christ raises us from the dead. If that is the case, then I struggle with a lot of Paul's language when it comes to what happens after we die. Because he talks about longing to depart and be with Christ. It's clear that he, he anticipates that when he dies, immediately he will be in the presence of Christ. Conscience conscious in some real sense of the presence of Christ. Now it's true, it may, it may be a period of waiting. It may be a period of, of, of uh, in a sense, being without a body, but there is, there, there's a consolation of being in the presence of Christ. Philippians 1.23 is, is one example of, of that kind of Reference by Paul. And even here, when he says that what is mortal may be swallowed up in life, I love that phrase there in verse 4. Um, do you see what Paul does there? In the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, we're repeatedly shown a picture of death swallowing us at the end of our lives. That the grave is waiting to swallow us. Isn't that a pleasant thought? Probably should have preached on this at, at Halloween. You know? <laughs> the grave, you know, the, the, the grave opening its arms. You know, all those horror movies were where these young couples are running through a cemetery and one of them falls into a, an, an open grave, you know. Uh, that's the picture of the, that comes through in the Old Testament, that, that the grave, it, it's Sheol, you know, death, is this, this monster, this unescapable reality that eventually is all going to suck us down into the earth. But what Paul says here actually doesn't originate with Paul. It originates with Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah looks forward to a day when, when death will be swallowed up by life. And Paul picks up on that. In fact, Paul doesn't use it once. He uses it twice. He uses it as well at the end of 1 Corinthians. 
So what's ahead for us is the result of what Jesus did on Easter Sunday. Jesus defeated death. Jesus turned death on its head. The grave had swallowed Jesus, and then Jesus turned around and defeated death and the devil and, and rose victorious. That's, that, he uses that term, victory. That's what we're looking forward to. How do we know? But how do we know that, that that's what's waiting for us? Um, I know an awful lot of believers who question their faith. They struggle. I myself struggled with whether I really belonged to Christ, with whether, whether I was really going to have a future in heaven. When I was a teenager, my early teen years, I struggled. And it wasn't until I was, I was confronted with the truth that I do not save myself. I don't do anything that, that, that can, can be taken away from me because this is not mine to give or take. Salvation is not mine. It is God's. It is God's work. It is God's act. It is God's gift. It's something he bestows on me. All I have to do is have the faith to believe it, to trust it, to accept it. And when I do that, God gives me something called an earnest deposit. Now, I assume that Pastor... um, Dylan, Dustin, (laughs) get those two mixed up. Pastor Dustin, when he went back, I probably, if he really sold his house or had a purchase agreement on his house out in, out west, that that he went back there and they, they had a purchase agreement arranged. How many of you ever signed a purchase agreement? Have any of you ever done it without exchanging money? No, you, do not, you don't sign a purchase agreement without making a down payment. And it's called earnest money. It's saying, I'm not just you know, going off half-cocked here. I've really thought this through. I'm committed to it. We're going to make this happen. That doesn't mean it doesn't sometimes fall through. But 90% of the time, it doesn't fall through because earnest money has changed hands. When God says, you belong to me, you are, you, are, you are mine in this world and in the next. You are my child. He doesn't pay money for you. He doesn't put a down payment of money on you. He actually gives you a part of himself. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells your life. God becomes part of you. God inhabits you. Now, I'm not talking about possession here. I'm just talking about a new... Somebody, I was talking to somebody just before service today about waking up the first day after trusting Christ as Savior, after being saved. And half awake, laying in bed, thinking, am I still going to feel that, that sense of new life the day after? Or was it just an emotional experience? And waking up and realizing, no, it's still there. He's still there. Now, that doesn't mean we, can't, we don't need to cultivate that life. It doesn't mean that, that, that our feelings don't ebb and flow. But we have an earnest deposit. We have something within us that tells us we belong to God. And if... If you don't have that sense, if you've never had that sense, then you, you maybe need to examine, okay, what's, what's the basis of my faith? Is, is there, do I really believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Have I really trusted him? And do I belong to him?
2 Corinthians 1, we, we covered this a, a couple of months ago. Verses 22, 21 and 22. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And that's all that Paul is saying here. He says it as well in Romans. He says it in Ephesians. The seal of the Holy Spirit on our lives. That's part of what the Spirit does when we trust in Christ. He puts his own seal on our hearts. So the rest of this passage is all talking about, so what? Yeah, we're all waiting for heaven. We're longing, longing for the day we'll see Christ. We're longing for the day we'll see our loved ones. We'll get heavenly bodies that are amazing. <clears throat> but so what? The last uh, five verses here, verses 6 through 10, really outline what, what should happen in our lives and w- what does happen in our lives as we wait, as we have our life in waiting. The first thing Paul says is confidence. Therefore, we are always confident. Why are we always confident? Because we know that as long as we're in the body, we're away from the Lord. Now, he doesn't mean the Lord is not in our lives. He just means that we're not in God's literal, physical presence. But but our confidence is based on the fact that Jesus Christ has already led the way, that our, our salvation is sealed by God himself through the Holy Spirit, and that we belong to God. If you're lacking confidence, it very likely is because you're not sure about your salvation. If you are not sure you belong to Christ, that's something you need to to nail down. Because the devil can pull all kinds of strings in your life if he can convince you well, you know, I, you know, you said that, but I don't know if you really believe that. And, you know, it gets you waffling around. It's a little like Satan in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? If he can get you doubting what God has said, he's got you right where he wants you. So the first thing that should characterize our lives as we wait for the, for the, for the end time is confidence. Now, that does not mean, by the way, that none of us ever has a question that we need answered. I think there's room for questioning in our faith. There's room for us to ask good theological foundational questions because we want an answer, not because we always have to be questioning, but because we want... God has put a natural curiosity in our hearts. So don't be afraid to ask questions, but ask them out of confidence. The second thing I see here that should characterize our lives as we wait is faith. We live by faith, not by sight. There's a good summary of Paul's teaching. He says the same thing in Romans, by the way, in in the very same context of this kind of teaching. You cannot go through life waiting for God to show you a sign every time you turn around. Any of you ever tried to live that way? I think there are a lot of people out there who want God to show them a sign before they act or before, they, before they'll, they'll take a risk. Show me, Lord. I, I got to see it with my own eyes. And Paul says the faith life is not that kind of life. Many times we will be called upon to act out of what we know, before we have assurance, before we have some confirmation from God that that's the right way to go. That's that's what makes it faith, folks. We know certain things. People say, well, how do you know God loves you? Because of what I know. Because I know that Jesus died for me. I have the record of the, of the Gospels. I have the record of the resurrection. I understand his motivation in dying for me. 
I understand God's motivation in sending him. I know that I am loved. And I know that he has my best interests at heart. No matter what else happens in life, no matter what disaster or disease strikes me, I know that. And so I can walk by faith even when my sight tells me it's difficult. It's uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen. But ultimately, I know who knows. So faith. Then he talks about pleasing God. Verse 9. So we make it our goal to please him. Whether we are home or in the body or away from it. Um, the goal of the Christian life should be the same as Jesus' prayer that he taught us to pray. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. I want to please God. I want to glorify God. And it's interesting that he says here, whether in this life or in the next. Paul seems to be saying here that our lives here should be about pleasing God just as they will be about pleasing God when we get to heaven. You know that God, you'll have jobs to do for God in heaven? I believe you will. There will be tasks that God gives you to do so that you can have the pleasure of pleasing God. So my life now shouldn't be just about, oh, I'm so depressed, I hate this world I live in, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired, I just can't wait to get to heaven, Lord, take me today which is how, honestly, I, I want to feel that way some days. I'm so glad com uh, political commercials are over. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's a guy in Wisconsin running for some district office. He started running a commercial about five days before the election. Then on election night, we heard he had been defeated. His commercial be continued to run all this last week. It was still running when we left Eau Claire on Friday, on Saturday. No wonder he lost. Anyway, I want to be pleasing God. I want to be active in serving and, and glorifying God right up to the day he takes me home. Because that's what my life's going to be like in heaven, too. Finally, I would say, based on verse 10, that we need careful planning. That careful planning in how we invest our lives needs to be how we live our lives in the time we have left. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body whether good or bad. Now, maybe some of you have been raised with the idea that we will never be judged, that believers will never be judged. It's true, you will never be judged with unbelievers. You will never be judged uh, where your soul is in the balance between heaven and hell. Christ took care of that. But here and elsewhere in the New Testament, there's evidence of a judgment that involves believers, those who belong to Christ. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 this, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day... That is the day of judgment, the day of redemption. We'll bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. 
He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. What is he saying there? He's saying that, that we, as we live our lives as believers, as we, as we use our time and resources, and as we, as we either submit to God or live lives out of the flesh, where we're just, our emotions and our, our egos are driving uh, what we're doing in life, rather than God's work in our hearts, to the extent that our lives are reflecting Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that is gold and silver and precious stones. Those things do not burn up. They will, they will be handed back to us at the last judgment. That's part of your heavenly inheritance. But the parts of our lives that are driven by, by ego and jealousy and... and uh, Ambition, which, by the way, drives most of what happens in our world, those things will be burned up when we stand before Christ. So I want to ask you, what, what will you be left with? And all of us have to face that, that issue in our lives. I want my life I want to make investments that will last. I want to make investments with my life and how I use my time, how I use my money, how I use my gifts. I want those things to reflect the power of God at work in me and a redeemed life and a redeemed mind and a redeemed heart. Basically, you could take this whole passage and boil it down to two things. Longing for heaven and living for heaven. And as we close today, um, I want to tell you just a quick story about when I was, I was about 14. And I came home from church one day with a, a, ma with, with a little uh, flyer of some kind that I got from from Sunday school or church. It might have been a Power magazine. Some of you remember Power. Um, on the back cover was something that was designed as a poster for teenagers to put up. And that's exactly what I did. I, I cut it out and I pasted it on my bulletin board. I tacked it on my bulletin board and here's what it said. It had a picture of a globe, the earth floating in space. And it said, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake. And it took, you know, the old, the old saying we all throw around, what, me, what on earth are you doing? And then we throw, for heaven's sake, will you stop? But it put them together so that, so that there was a positive message. There was a message of, what am I doing while I'm on this earth for the sake of heaven? How am I investing for eternity? So on the one hand, I long for heaven. On the other hand, I live for heaven. Let's all make it our business in the power of the Holy Spirit to live for heaven.